welcome to Clear Eyes, Full Hearts, a podcast presentation of Cadence 13 in association with Black Barrel Media and Ritual Productions. This is an episode-by-episode look at the award-winning TV show Friday Night Lights created by Peter Berg. I'm Stacey Orstano, and I play Mindy Collette Riggins, and I got that out in one breath. And I'm Derek Phillips, and I play Bill E. Riggins. <laughs> That's how you said it. I just copy whatever you Because I, I ran out of breath. Our assumption is that you, our listeners, have already watched the show. But if you haven't already, go watch Friday Night Lights, which is currently streaming on Netflix and Peacock TV, because there will be spoilers in our podcast. Y'all, we still have merchandise. That's right, baby. We got merchandise. So please go check out our new website at www.cleareyesfullheartspod.com. Once again, that's cleareyesfullheartspod.com. We've got hoodies, we've got t-shirts, we've got mugs, we've got stickers. Get something nice for mom for Mother's Day. Every few weeks, we'll do an audience participation episode just to answer your questions. So email us burning, burning FNL questions at cleareyesfullheartspod at gmail.com today. We're talking about season one, episode 16, Black Eyes and Broken Hearts. It was written by Patrick Massett and John Zinman and directed by Jeffrey Reiner. Our NBC synopsis goes a little something like this. Racial tensions are at an all-time high as the black players on the Dillon Panthers refuse to play unless Coach Mac McGill is fired for his comments. And this is a big episode for most of our main characters. So let's get into the highlights. So, Stacey, we spoke early on in this podcast about FNL having a tough time in the ratings, and FNL at this point was still struggling. But because of critical acclaim, the show was officially picked up for what we call the back nine. As we've discussed before, when a television show is picked up by the network, in this case NBC, they agree to a certain amount of episodes. NBC originally ordered 13 episodes of Friday Night Lights. And as I said before, because of the critical acclaim, they agreed to order nine more episodes, giving us a full 22 episodes in this first season, which is what all of us know as of the first season of Friday Night Lights. But we were still on very, very thin ice at this point in time in the show and at this specific point in the season. And any kind of major problems at this point would very likely cause NBC to pull the plug on the show. A lot of people don't actually know this, but FNL was almost canceled midway through, and midway through meaning episode 15. And that was due to a local strike that happened. It's part of the reason the storyline with the Riggins boys and their father kind of seems a little bit disjointed because multiple scenes were actually cut from episode 15, which we talked about last week, and episode 16 as a result of the cuts in episode 15. And I'm going to be talking about a lot of that in, in far more detail next week when we have our special guest, Brett Cullen, who played my deadbeat dad on the show. But just keep in mind that due to that local strike, this was almost the last episode of Friday Night Lights. So that's kind of a crazy thing to think about, that this could have just been it. 15 episodes, that's it. We would have never had Michael B. Jordan on the show. Oh, Jesus. We would have never had all the characters that are that come in in season four and five, all the characters from season two and three, and all that storyline could have just been over like that. And I would have only have ever had 10 lines on the show at all. I'm making this about me now. <laughs> No, but I think about that regularly. I mean, how close to this show being over with, it's kind of crazy. I do feel when I hear you and Brett and other people tell stories like that, I feel so just like a little bit naive because I was such a, a weird in and out kind of day player guest star. And I just didn't, I lived in like a little la-la world with rainbows and bubbles. And I was like, we're going to do this show forever because I had no idea. I mean, I was actually here for, for when this happened, but I didn't know that we were on the cusp of actually having the show canceled until probably a couple weeks, maybe even a month or so afterwards, when I talked to uh, Nan Bernstein about it, who was our line producer on the show, and she let me know that that episode in particular, episode 15, we were really on the cusp of, of potentially being done. But as I said, we're going to talk about all that stuff, the, the strike that happened in, in a little bit more detail. Okay, straight off the bat, here's my thoughts. So this is the genius plan that Coach and Everyone comes up with. They're just going to pull up JV players and put them on the Dillon Panthers right before state. There's nothing else they want to try. They don't want to try a team dinner, a symposium, <laughs> maybe some sensitivity training. It's like, nope, bring up those worst players onto this team. 
I mean, Tammy did try the sensitivity training thing and that didn't necessarily work out well, but this always makes me laugh because my freshman year in high school, I was on a, our JV football team went undefeated. And as kind of a reward, mm -hmm. they brought up some of the ninth grade kids to the varsity for like what? the last three games. Yeah. For like the last three games of the season, we were bumped up to varsity. But you're just little babies. Yeah. I, I was tiny, Stacy. I got out there and I was finally getting hit for the first time by varsity <laughs> athletes. And I mean, I'm telling you, it was a completely and totally different world. As a ninth grader, you've kind of barely just gotten through puberty. You know what I mean? I think I was, I was such a late bloomer. I don't think I'd even started puberty at this point in time. So I'm getting hit by basically grown ass men. And I remember thinking, wow, I don't know if I want to play football, if this is what it feels like going forward. But yeah, so watching those kids out on the football field, <laughs> it makes me laugh. I feel you because I went to volleyball camp in Connecticut and you had to be going into high school. So I think it was ninth grade and up, but we lied and said that I was, but I was actually sixth grade going into seventh grade, but I've been 5'10 my entire life. So I got away with it. But there was part of it too, because like I was playing some like varsity volleyball guys and I was like, they're, they're so mean. I don't know if yeah. I could do this, but it made me a way better player. Sorry, camp that we lied to. I'm glad that I stuck it out because there's that part of me. I don't know where I would be in my life right now as an actor or as a human if, if I'd have given up playing football at that age. But I remember thinking these guys are way better than me. And like, I have no business being on this field. It taught me a lot of life lessons about just kind of very simply getting knocked down and getting back up again. But one of my favorite moments in this, not favorite moment necessarily, but Coach Crowley, who's the coach that we see pulling all the names off the board. He's pulling all the black players' names off the magnetic depth chart board. Coach Crowley, guy's name is actually Tim Crowley. And Tim Crowley was the equipment manager behind the scenes on Friday Night Lights. So he was the guy giving everyone all their pads and all their helmets and everything else every week. Crowley in real life was an NCAA football referee. And his advice on Friday Night Lights behind the scenes was indispensable for everyone who played a coach on the show, including Kyle Chandler. He essentially was the technical advisor behind the scenes for all the football scenes. His help was, as I said, indispensable, especially when I came on board as a coach. I'd be sitting there in the middle of a scene and be like, hey, uh, what do you think my guy would yell? And it's something like this. <laughs> like, what's a line that my guy could say? Because I played football, but I don't know football backwards and forwards the way that Coach Crowley knows football backwards and forwards. As I said, the guy's an official. He's a referee. So he would have me yelling in like plays like, I write 25 mm. dive on two, you know, that kind of stuff. Although Billy was a, a defensive guy. So he would have me yelling out defensive plays to players. But I just love when he kind of gets a couple of lines in here to, to, to be an actor. It's always fun to see that. One of the characters' names that they pull off the board, his last name is Biggums. So I would like to say that on this team, there is Riggins and Biggums. And I would think that there was some comedy in there that we never got to see. Yeah, I didn't know there was a Biggums. <laughs> a Biggums. Okay, Derek, I stopped it and I paused it to get the check mark at exactly three minutes and one second into this show. Tim Riggins yells, get your head out of your ass. And I, I want to say, sup NBC. Sup, yeah, sup what's NBC. Up, NBC. How come I wasn't allowed to say it, but you let my brother say it? It's only for series regulars. They can Maybe it's it. only for series regulars. Maybe it's, there are times where it slides by the sensors and it's yeah. possible that it did. Because if you listen for it, you can hear it, but it's not extremely, you kind of have to listen for it. Yeah, almost. it's a throwaway for sure. Yeah, it's a throwaway, but it's definitely in, the, I mean, it's written up there in the uh, closed captioning. So, I mean, <laughs> you what do you watch it with closed captioning? I do sometimes. Well, especially as I get older, there's a lot of things I watch with closed captioning, <laughs> but it helps me, especially when we're doing a rewatch on this show, to yeah. make sure that I'm getting names right and everything else. God, that's actually really smart. Also, I do love that he doesn't have any lines yet, but we finally said his name and we get to see Coach Spivey, who's played by our friend Aaron Spivey, becoming a bigger character. And it's just right now, so far, only with looks. He's got those those FNL looks and moments, things happening during the team, but he'll he'll become a bigger part later on. But shout out Coach Spivey. He's another guy behind the scenes that was a huge help to me when I became a football coach on the show. Jumping back in, I'm going to be honest with you. I've, I've been singing Julie's praises all throughout this show. Mm -hmm. I hate this scene with Julie. This scene where mm -hmm. she comes home and she's being a little smart aleck with her parents. Not a big fan. And I think I'm officially old because I sat there watching the scene thinking, you better watch your tone, young lady. There is that. I call it the teenager tone. And it's a tone that especially teenage girls tend to have when they're talking to their parents and their moms. But it's why, I mean, let me tell you honest with you, teenagers terrify me. I'm right there with you. Completely. And Amy does a real, real good job with that. Just 
over all of you guys. I'm over you parents. Yeah. When you said teenagers terrify you, I mean, to this day, I still have nightmares from doing like high school matinees back when I was doing theater on a regular basis. <gasps> They're the worst. They're the most honest audience on the planet. But I remember doing a production of The Winter's Tale years ago, and we're in the middle of a scene, and one of the actors in the show was kind of going up on his lines, and he didn't know his stuff all that well. And the kids just started going, you suck! Yep. <laughs> in the middle of the show. And this actor got pissed off and then screamed out, shut the F up to the high school matinee. And I'm sitting there on stage like, oh my gosh, get me out of here. But these, they're brutal, man. They're honest. While we were on break from Friday Night Lights, I was doing a production of The Spitfire Girl, a musical, and we did a Q&A afterwards with our high school audience. And like very earnestly, one of the teens asked, so do, do any of you guys ever want to be like real actors? And David, one of the leads, goes, I'm sorry, what do you mean? And she was like, you know, like real actors, like on TV. And he was like, well, this one over here is on Friday Night Lights and the rest of us bus star bus doing eight shows a week on Broadway. So I don't know what you mean by real actor. And I was like, oh, I think it'll calm down. It's going to be okay. Teenagers are terrifying. I will say this about the high school matinees back in the day, though. If you were in a good show and you could win them over, I don't care about any critic for the New York Times or anywhere else. If I could get a bunch of high school kids who didn't want to go see a play Liking it by the end, I felt yeah. like I had succeeded. They did a good job of that with Hamilton when they brought in for free just a bunch of high school yeah. kids learning history in a way that they never had before. So it does work and some teenagers are awesome. I'm just putting that disclaimer out Shakespeare there Shakespeare used to call that audience the witch one. If you could get the witch one on your side, play to the witch one and not the plebeians. Huh. But I, I kind of always think of like the high school matinee. <laughs> I don't know if Shakespeare ever had to do high school matinees back in the day. Maybe that's who he meant by the witch one. That's the group you want to impress. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, so I have never felt closer to Landry in that I agree that nothing says sorry like a good mix CD. I was king of burning a mix CD. What do you know? Let me tell you about mix CD, Stacey. I love a mix CD. I had, I had baby face on there. I mm -hmm. had a little REO Speedwagon's Greatest Hits, 369. Nice. You know, I can't fight this feeling anymore. Great I'm song. not going to sing it for Peter. Peter Gabriel. Are these the ones that you would give girls or just this was like your in the car music? This, this was not my in the car music. This was my, I'm going to impress this lady when I get her back to my place and play this CD. And uh, oh, hopefully, hopefully you guys, things are going to happen. Side note, Derek loves Sade. Just so I you do know. love Sade. I had a little Sade on there as well. I did actually put it on one time when I was in college. <laughs> so the girl's like, what is this? Because I I made this CD. It's magic? Yeah. I had this CD. I had my candles going with my uh, empty bottles of wine that mm -hmm. were filled up with highlighter fluid and I would turn on my black light. It's weird that you're not married, Derek. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was pretty sexy stuff back in the day, Stace. Okay. I truly, I truly have to say Tim Riggins in a position of authority is great. Growing on me, we saw him coach the power pop. Power, the Power Girls, the Power Puff Girls. I couldn't do. I couldn't say it last week. It's all good. Powder Puff. And now I like him with these JV players in another world. If he honed that energy in a little bit, I think he'd be a really good coach. I love it. Yeah, he's sitting there in the in the lunch line with the one kid, and he's asking him where this kid's supposed to be on a certain play. And the mm -hmm. kid kind of stutters for a bit, and Kitch goes, "Too late. Play's over. You waited too long to make a decision. Now we lost the game because of you. We're not going to state in the whole town, and Dylan hates you. You're never going to get laid your entire life. Fact." I love that the writers are finally giving Kitsch, as I said, this material, because he really is comedically, I mean... He's got just innate comic timing. He's got those comic chops, baby. And I just love that scene. It just makes me laugh every time. And apparently none of them get to eat lunch either. So there you go. <laughs> right. Yeah, he, he prevents them from having any food. Then we cut right into this uh, Coach and Max scene. It gets intense. Coach has just had a, a meeting with all of his other assistant coaches, and Mac wasn't invited to the meeting. And... Coach basically puts it all out there and says, look, man, there's a good chance that you're going to wind up getting the boot because of your comments. Maybe it hadn't sunk into Mac the weight of his words yet or, or the, the repercussions of them until that moment. 
because things start to change a little bit from this moment on. Yeah, he's not recognizing the severity of what he said. And then the Booster Club and Buddy say to Coach that Mac has to go, which Mac and Buddy have been besties forever. So it speaks to me like the true heart of Dylan that nothing is more important than football, not even decades of friendship. Yeah, and let's be clear here. The Booster Club and Buddy aren't wanting Mac to go because of his comments as much as it is. They want him gone because of the strife that the comments have created. Yeah, we need some Smashback. Yeah, we need Smashback. Now we cut over to a scene that's got a little bit more levity to it. And we're at this little shop in town. And Matt's trying to find a gift to buy Julie to basically apologize for being in the in the jacuzzi with a bunch of rally girls. And the woman in this store is awesome. I love I love her in the scene. But this is one of those Friday Night Lights moments. I, I think we've talked about it before where Jeffrey Reiner would just grab whoever the actual shop owner was. And rather than hiring an actor to come in and play a shop owner, he'd be like, just give me the shop owner. And this was the actual owner of this shop. And he just had her play the scene. As we've said before on this show, it kind of adds to that authenticity. It just feels real. Sometimes he'd grab somebody and be like, hey, just come in here and play the shop owner. And they'd freeze up underneath the lights. But this woman did a great job. If I ever got a $50 gift in high school from a high schooler to another one, that's that's a big gift. Yeah. His uh, his Alamo freeze pocket money is Landry Collard or whatever it was. That's a lot of money. I do have to say, once again, guidance counselor Tammy is right. She says Max statements are a fireable offense. And she's yeah. correct. But then also wife and friend Tammy say the same thing. Care goes, the three of you scare me. And they should because they're always right. I love that Kyle starts the scene off by saying, I got a guidance counselor emergency. It's maybe my new favorite line. Yeah. And also the three of you scare me. I take it back. That's my new favorite line. They're they're both gold. What Max said is a fireable offense. We're going to have to see how it plays out in the rest of this episode, but it is a fireable offense. 100%. I just like him going to his wife, friend, and guidance counselor for advice too. That just goes to show the heart of their relationship. That was a lovely gesture. Not a gesture. He actually needed it, I guess. Well, yeah, but I mean, I think that that's why this relationship is kind of heralded as is one of the best TV relationships ever is there is that give and take and they talk to each other and they may have little disputes and little arguments, but at the end of the day, they respect each other intellectually. They respect each other emotionally. This is the perfect person to go to. He knows that, but he also knows that at the end of the day, it's his decision to make. It's a tough decision here. Moving into this next, another hard convo with Mac and Coach, this is the first time that I've seen a softer side of Mac or where he realizes the the weight and the severity of what he said. And he's speaking to something that I've always held so true when he starts talking about his father and growing up with it. And the thing is, is that nobody is born with hate in their heart. Hate is taught and hate is learned. And Mac is realizing that he garnered that from his father. Maybe he wants to start changing his ways, being not the person his father was trying to make him be. One of the things I love that the writers did in this scene is rather than have Mac come over and apologize which he does. He also comes over and basically says, I'm handing you my resignation. So Mac's not trying to save his job here by coming over and apologizing to coach. He's coming over and saying, look, man, I care about these kids. I think you guys have a good shot at winning state and I don't want to be the one in the way. But he also at the same time admits that he made a mistake here, which I think is important moving forward because it just makes coach's job that much harder. Because it'd be easy to just let him go. But now you're this guy is, is actually, I think, legitimately sorry for his mistakes and is going to, what it appears to me as is is legitimately going to try to make an effort to change. And that makes Coach's job that much harder. That's another thing that I thought about going into the next scene with him and Tammy when he's talking about the resignation and he says, I know what's easy and I know what's right. And it's like the world puts their problems on this man's shoulders and never once have I seen Eric Taylor go, eh, not my problem. I can't deal with that. He like takes everything on. That's why I think Friday Night Lights still stands the test of time is that 15 years later, we're still asking the question when somebody does something like what Mac McGill does, what is the correct response? Is it canceling that person? Is it firing that person? Is it making sure that person is never allowed to work again? Or is it the fact that the person is legitimately sorry for what they did? And do we allow them back in as as a society? And I don't know the answer to that, but I think that that's one of the wonderful things about Friday Night Lights is that it's asking those questions 15 years ago. God, that's true. But anyway, yeah, just another really powerful scene, well acted by Lou Deckert and, and Kyle Chandler. Tyra wants to take Julie to a movie, but first they need to come apparently grab cash that I owe her, which I highly doubt. And Tyra says she needs to go to the women's low self-esteem palace. Just really, Tyra. (laughs) 
But then we get to what I'm going to call the best part of this whole episode. I say 11 words. I say 11 words in this whole episode. Really, they could turn the whole turn the whole show around. What are your 11 words? Do you remember? I don't know. Something that I told you about not, I told you about not bringing your friends back here or something. Something. <laughs> it's so much more powerful than the Mac McGill storyline is me coming in and having 11 words. But the hair looked good in these scenes. Nope. I thought the hair looked great. Oh, here's the thing about the hair. And I had forgotten about this, but looking back, I used to look around at the other the other girls who were playing the other dancers, and I was like, their hair's so pretty, and it's so natural, and it's so just like curled and down and flowy, and you could flip it around. But in the hair and makeup trailer, they jacked my hair up to Jesus. They would tease it, and they would hairspray it, and they would make it really big and really Texas, and I hated it. And I thought that it started to make Mindy into a caricature, and mm. I I fought back against it. And I, I lost a lot, but finally, when I started to have a little bit more of a of a, a voice or a stance, it started to get better in season three. It's also one of the things that I think was really cool about Friday Night Lights is that you could have those conversations and it wasn't the end of the world. It wasn't, how dare you have this conversation with me? It was an artistic conversation. Totally. And know? there was always an answer for it. They were like, no, yeah. this is, she's a little bit more this. And I was like, okay, great. Pick and choose my battles. But it, I, I don't, I don't love that here. And then my next thought in this scene, I screamed out, Waxman! Yeah, so rewatching this, I had totally forgot. forgotten that Michael Waxman was in this show. I mean, I remember Waxman popping up, but just for you guys at home, Michael Waxman is the bald uh, cop with the goatee who winds up arresting Landry and uh, Julie and Saracen all for being in, in the strip club under Agent age. Thomas. Was that his character's name? Agent Thomas? Agent Thomas. Agent Thomas, it. this is my badge. <laughs> That's great. Listen, he's a really good actor. He was great in the scene. Michael Waxman was our first AD on multiple episodes of Friday Night Lights. He also was a producer on the show. And then later in later seasons, wound up directing a lot of episodes lot. of Friday Night Lights in the last two or three seasons. He's now currently like the directing showrunner on... Chicago... Chicago Med? Med? Yeah. Yes, Chicago yeah, Med. Chicago Med. But yeah, and literally one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet on the planet. God, uh, he's been working... Decades oh, and decades. For decades and decades and decades. He was like did every one of like Michael Mann's movies back in the day as a first AD. Michael Waxman and I were we're still friends and we keep in touch, but I hadn't seen like his face in a very long time. So I just screamed at his name. It made me very happy. I got to work with Waxman. Uh he cast me as a he was directing an episode of a show called Breakout Kings. Never heard of it. Well, it's no longer on the air, but Michael Waxman cast me. On, on an episode of Breakout Kings where I got to play a uh, man who was accused of child molestation. But I wasn't. What? I was actually innocent, but I break out of prison and clear my name. I remember you. that, actually. Yeah. You know that yeah. show. Thank you, Waxman, for casting me. Thanks, Max. So all of the kids, the kiddos, go into a holding cell. It was so strange to see the guys backstage at a strip club too. Like we take a lot of allowances <laughs> on this show. The four of them are in a holding cell. All of them get taken home by their parents, but they keep Amy or Julie inside. And then finally Coach and Tammy get them home from the holding cell and listen. When they get home, she tells them about Mindy and why they were at the landing strip. And I'm just going to say this whole episode had a lot of dogging on on strip clubs in general and strippers in general. And I was not a fan. I'm just going to go ahead and say this. I love this episode. I love our show. This really kind of stuck in my gut a little bit. I have quite a few people that I love that have at one point or another danced in their lives and they are hardworking women making an honest wage to feed their families and just feel like there was a lot of judgment placed on on that as a profession. And while I get where they're coming from, it's something about it really hit me in an ugly way. You had to play a stripper at some point in time in your life or an exotic dancer. I apologize. You played an exotic dancer. And so Same thing. because of but because of that experience, I think it probably changed the way you thought about it. If I told you the number of exotic dancer strippers I've played in my life, it would blow your mind. We'll get into that later. But I mean, do you think that part of the reason that you're sensitive to that is because of the fact that you've had the opportunity to play these characters? Yes, and because I know so many of them now. You can't just play Mindy as a two-dimensional person, and you didn't. And it's part of the reason why I think we love Mindy. So we've gotten into like the game part of the, of the actual show right now. I mean, this is a pretty heated little match here. And I'm going to be honest, this team is dirtier than Arnett meets Stacey Oristano. They're mean and big. They're mean, they're big. And uh, these guys, there's a lot of what we would call home cooking 
And that's when the officials in this game are making some really terrible calls. You might start to question whether or not they might have been paid off by the uh, Dunstan Valley Cardinals. Smash is getting face masked on plays. There's late hits. There's all kinds of stuff going on. But then the, like the worst part of it, Smash winds up scoring a touchdown later in the game, late in the third quarter. And like literally like five seconds after the play, one of the Dunstan Valley Cardinal linebackers Knock Smash on his ass, late hit. And then when Smash gets up, he calls him a tar baby. And like Smash and Riggins have been at each other's throats for like the past two episodes. They've been disagreeing with each other. But I love this moment right now because Riggins sees it and he hears it. And he comes sprinting from across the field and knocks this other kid on his ass, which leads to like this bench clearing brawl between both teams. All hell breaks loose. The officials get in, they break the fight up, blah, 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 blah. The two coaches come together. They're meeting underneath the stadium. The heads of UIL, which is the Texas Athletic Commission, essentially decides this game's over. Usually you would play four quarters, three quarters. but because they are three quarters of the way in, it's going to be all hell on that field. I think fans are going to get involved. It gets really, really nasty. Oh, it would get dark. So the officials decide to call the game, which means that Dylan winds up winning the game. I've played some games that got heated. Maybe not as heated as this, but when we were leaving the locker room, the coach would say, hey, all you guys keep your helmets on. Don't take your pads off. <gasps> keep your helmets on because, God forbid, people are going to be throwing stuff oh at my you. God. So keep your helmets on as they go back to the bus. And if you notice, all the Dylan players have their helmets on. And this crowd is throwing crap at them, blah, blah, blah. It gets nasty. I like that the show shows this, but it's awful oh, when yeah. this kind of stuff happens, especially when these are kids. So all the players line up, they get back on the bus, they got their helmets on and stay in their pads. And what happens next is they, they get out of town, they're driving. I don't know how, how far down the road they get, but all of a sudden this, this cop car pulls up and it pulls the whole entire team bus over. It's nuts because cell phones nowadays would be out. Can you imagine every single one of them would be recording it? 100%. Is that something they could do? If it really had happened that way, could a player be 100%. arrested? 100%. It happens all the time where players get arrested really? for assault. Yeah. Now, it doesn't necessarily I'll happen stuff like, on, the, on field? the field. 100%. 100%. Players have gotten arrested I for assault. I did not know this. Sometimes... Like, I can't think of an instance where it's happened. Well, that's not true. I remember seeing something recently where there was a kid in Florida who tackled and started punching a referee. Oh, and they, they arrested the kid on site. This, though, obviously, you're in hostile territory. You're in another city. Yeah, and they said smash through the first punch, and he didn't even throw a punch. It was Riggins. It's home cooking. There is a video that I saw today, and I didn't think about it till now, so I don't remember, but I I think it was Alabama. So they had they played a basketball game and the coach got really mad at the ref, threw all of the team chairs, like some into the stands and all over and dumped all the trash cans over. And after the game, everybody leaves, but one player stayed behind and picked up all of the trash in the trash cans and put the chairs back to where they were supposed mm -hmm. to be. And it was just like, kudos to that young man for realizing like what his coach yeah. had done. It was just like a really moving moment. And the crowd was like, started to help him and stuff. It was really sweet. I haven't seen that. That's I'll have to look for that video. But yeah, I mean, that that stuff does happen. It's the ugly side of high school athletics. But yeah, so the, I mean, Stacey, we used to play football games down at this place. There was football in the Keys, believe it or not, like in Coral Shores or in Marathon. And there were a couple games where, I mean, the local fans... I think especially that, that this stuff happens in Texas too. It's these smaller towns where there's not a lot going on on Friday night. Everyone's been drinking all day and emotions get out of control. And that's what happens in this situation. But even the cops getting involved in this, this is where it gets shady. There's a nice little arc, I thought, for Mac McGill here because he gets off the bus and he goes to talk to these cops. These cops are like, we want to pull Smash off because Smash threw a punch, which as you and I just discussed, that's not true. Smash did not throw the mm -hmm. first punch. Mac McGill says, you're not getting on this bus without a warrant. It's mm -hmm. kind of his opportunity to, to make amends for his past actions. And so, yeah, he prevents these cops from coming on the bus. And in the end, I think he and Smash have kind of come to at least some kind of understanding where they can move forward. I like this moment with Mac. I don't love him saying they made a mistake just mm -hmm. like I did. Those cops weren't making a mistake. We know exactly what they were doing. But also, I hope, and again, because I, I don't know, I hope this is the start for Mac because this can't be the end of it. He needs to show the rest of those players through his actions moving forwards that this is who he is because like this isn't enough. But it's a great moment. I agree with you on that. I don't know that we as an audience get to see if that ever happens for Mac. I don't think moving forward there's any other kind of stuff with Mac 
regarding any kind of racial tensions or anything like that. But it was yeah, a it's moment. a good moment. But I agree with you. That's not going to cut it, Mac. You need a little bit more than that, but it's a start. I think it's a start. Mm-hmm. So the episode ends at least on, well, the episode actually ends on a good note. Julie and Matt get together and Julie is officially forgiven Matt, especially after Matt buys his $50 get out of jail free necklace. And uh, he asked her to officially be his girlfriend. Be, be my girlfriend. She says yes. And for tonight, Stacy, just for tonight, everything is all right in Dylan. That was so deep. And I was going to let it just linger <laughs> there and sit. But I wanted to tell you how good that was. Thank you, Stacy. Guys, that is actually it for episode 16. Join us next time for our fourth bonus episode where we'll answer all your FNL questions. So until then, clear eyes. Full hearts. Can't lose. Clear Eyes, Full Hearts is a podcast presentation of Cadence 13 in association with Black Barrel Media and Ritual Productions. Executive producers are Stacey Oristano and Derek Phillips, Chris and Mandy Wimmer for Black Barrel Media, and Steve Walters for Ritual Productions. Our producer is Miranda Parham. Send your questions to clearEyesFullHeartsPod at gmail.com. Find us on social media. I'm Stacey Oristano on Twitter and Instagram. And I'm at Derek Phillips on Twitter and underscore Derek Phillips on Instagram. And check out our websites, clearEyesFullHeartsPod.com, Cadence13.com, and BlackBarrelMedia.com. Thank you guys for listening, and we'll see you next week.